I'd like to invite our special guest today, Jeff Wardle, to do his presentation on high seas. This stuff looks great, so please give me your undivided attention and go for it. Uh, so I'm going to talk about high Z glass today, um, specifically uh, an EAPG, Early American Pattern Glass um, pattern called Wayne Stroll. So I'm going to give you a brief history on high Z. I'm going to talk a little bit about EAPG in general, and I'm going to add my first story on collecting Wayne Stroll, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the pattern itself, and I've brought some examples that we can talk about. So A.H. Heisey and Company uh, started in about 1896 um, by Augustus H. Heisey, who was an immigrant from Germany. Uh, very motivated guy. He actually, when he first came over, he started working for uh, George Duncan and Sons last week. And he moved up through their uh, ranks. And he actually married George Duncan's daughter. Uh very, very motivated guy. Uh, at that point, he started his own glass company, which you think might be a problem for competition. But from letters and things from that time period, uh, we know that he, there was a lot of price fixing going on between these companies, and it really wasn't as much competition as you might think, and they would move into different niche markets and not really try to sell against each other, particularly, I suppose, when you're daughter is married to a guy running another company. Um, so when they started out, when he started the company in about 1896, it was during that period where if you were very wealthy, there was a lot of fine cut glass crystal coming over from Europe. And if you could afford that, that was great. But most people could not afford that. Uh, so what happened in the United States here was that they started making pressed or pattern glass that looked very similar to the cut glass coming over from Europe, but it was much more reasonably priced, hence the early American pattern glass. And that period uh, is anywhere from about 1850 up to about 1916. I really more think about it from more of the 70s, 80s, 1870s, 1880s, up through the mid-teens there. Uh, but you can you can bring it all the way back to about 1850. Um, I brought a couple of examples because the wing scroll that we're going to talk about is kind of different from most of the pattern glass that you see. So I brought a couple of other examples of high Z pattern glass that's more similar to what you're used to. Uh, this is uh, pattern number 305. Uh, at the time, most of the patterns just had numbers. Uh, they really didn't market it with names too much at that time. This was number 305 or line 305. The collector name for this is Punty and Diamond Point, which makes a lot of sense. And this is more like mimics that fine cut glass that you would see coming out of Europe. Um, the, other, the other type that they would have is the, what we call the Colonial. And it's planar, but this actually mimics the cut panels coming over from Europe as well. Only far more reasonable for the average American to be able to afford this stuff. Um, before I get into wing scroll itself here, um, why do I collect this pattern? So I remember back in the mid to late 90s, uh, looking through the books that I had on Heise Glass and studying them and just being fascinated by it. Um, my grandmother had split up a set of Heisey orchid etched glassware between three grandkids and um, started to fill in what we didn't have in that set. Um, but I got more interested in the rest of it and was just fascinated by all the patterns and the length of time um, that, that Heisey, which actually closed in 1956, was, was, in, was, in, uh, was working and how many different types of patterns there were. And I remember coming across Wing Scroll and, and thinking, it's got like a weird, almost alien look to it. It's so strange, <laughs> so strange. And, and you know, here it is from the late 1800s, actually 
1899 to 1901, only for three years. I'm never gonna see a piece of this stuff anyway, but it's just really interesting. And it's stuck in my mind um, as I was looking through it and seeing all these patterns. Um, and so one summer, when I still frequented the Kane County flea market, mm -hmm. in one of the open fields, I came across a few pieces in the ivory verde or custard type of this glass. And I couldn't believe it. So I negotiated with the vendor there and ended up with three or four pieces in the custard glass. And as you all know, of course, if you have three or more pieces of something, <laughs> it's <Yep>. a collection. <laughs> so that's how that all started for me. And since then, I have filled it in over the last 25 years. Uh, and this is probably a third of my collection here. Um, uh, and most, I don't, you just don't see a lot of it around. Uh, what you do see are generally table sets or berry sets. So part of this early American pattern glass, what, what every table at the turn of the century seemed to have was what they call a table set, which as probably most of you know, it, it was a creamer, a sugar, a covered butter, and a spooner. Now what the hell is a spooner? As far as I can tell, it was just an open container that had spoons in it. And you would take them out and use them for whatever. And you would not return them to the spoon when you're done. It was one time use or one person use on those things. But it seemed like every, when you were, when you were gonna host a dinner party, everybody had that on their table. The other thing was a berry bowl set. So that usually consisted of a, bear, a master berry bowl about eight inches across or so, but that varied by a bit, and six smaller individual berry, berry bowls, uh, probably about half whatever that master was. You could see them from eight to 10 inches sometimes, and then the berry bowls from three to four or five inches, let's say. Um, those were the two very most common uh, types of EAPG that you'd see. But so, of course, I didn't bring any of those. <laughs> uh, I decided to kind of focus on some of the more unusual items uh, that I see. And so if anybody has questions as we're going along, please go ahead and shout out. I may not see a hand or anything, so just say, hey, Jeff, I uh, no need to hold any questions. Let's keep this as informal as possible here. Uh, Jeff, how, Jeff, how many different pieces do they make? Like different shapes, I should say. Oh, in in the wing scroll? Yes. I have no idea. <laughs> and I'll tell you the the catalog reprints that I have seen have a very limited number compared to what's out there. So it's very difficult to figure out. I've I've never seen catalog reprints with a vase. Ever. And here I have five of them right here in various sizes in, in custard. Um, I've heard tell of ones that are wow. this tall in the custard. I've seen them in emerald and maybe even one in crystal, uh, but there's no reference to those anywhere. And is that the, the three colors that they made or the three different variations there? Well, well they actually made um, four colors if you count uh, the canary or Vaseline. Um, and, and I've got representative pieces of all that. So it's the, what they called Ivorina Verde or green ivory in the custard. Uh, emerald green, crystal, what they called opal, which is the milk glass. And what you'll notice with this, like a lot of the old milk glasses, when you hold it up to a light, it's got an orange cast to it. Uh, and then what the Heise called canary, which is what we consider the Vaseline glass here. And then I have a very, very rare piece of canary opalescent here. This was not production. That was either done as special orders or a whimsy piece that a factory worker would create on their lunch hour or something like that. So those are the actually the four colors that they're done. And I've heard tell of other odd pieces, uh, a, a deep blue, a few other things that I've never actually seen but heard of. But those would all be experiments of some sort. So Jeff, where did you find the dish? This one? Mm -hmm. I purchased that in the Newark, Ohio, where the fact where the Heise factory was, okay. uh, from someone from that town, okay. and I was thrilled to have it. Okay. Just, just thrilled. And um, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen 
the berry bowls like that in the Vaseline are opalescent, but really not seen much else. So not so much out in the uh, flea markets or, or, or the actual stores? No, no. I mean, like no, 95% I mean, of the wing scroll that I purchased was at the Heise Convention. Right. Uh, I really haven't seen much of it around anywhere else. Um, and, and if it is, it's the table sets or the berry bowls, the things like that. Yeah. They're more common things. Um, correct. Uh, so, I just, okay, so talked a little bit about the colors here. Um, so in terms of scarcity of color, um, the custard is actually the, the most prevalent, uh, followed by the emerald, followed by the crystal. Crystal is actually fairly rare. Um, and I brought, I probably have, like I said, it's probably a third of my crystal, but I probably have one of the largest collections of crystal wig scroll that, that exists. Um, opal is a very unusual color and Vaseline is even more so. Um, and then of course the, the canary opalescent there is, you just don't see it around. Um, I was thrilled telling that one. And that, that was a recent purchase just a couple of years ago at convention. And up till then, I'd heard about those pieces, but I'd never even seen one. So that's really, cool. as you know, it's really exciting when you get a piece like that. I like the odd stuff personally. So when I can get a hold of something like that, it, I'm thrilled. Um, talking a little more about the custard, uh, I bought this piece just because it was such a different color from most of what I had, just to kind of show the variation. And when I saw that, in a dimly lit place. <laughs> I almost thought it was open. It's, say, it's, yeah. it's light enough there, um, but I did recognize it for what it was and picked it up just because I thought it was neat, that it, that it was such a different variation from what I've seen. Now, Heise, dec Heise decorated at the factory a number of different things here. They put the gold on these pieces that you see here. Um, they also added, um, brown and purple and green and that would be similar to this where they might put it on the rims and then on the scrolls themselves um, I don't have any pieces of that it's fairly unusual and fairly ugly <laughs> um, you know I, I might add a representative piece to my collection if I came across it but I don't have any um, or I would have brought a piece here the most interesting thing that they put on it is this hand painted rose decoration this was also done at the factory, and you can see it painted on a number of sets. Um, my God, this little guy here, that's really, really well done. Um, that one's great. And of course, in the early 1900s, they stopped the gold because the at the time, the women that they employed to uh, apply this stuff all started coughing up blood and died because they were inhaling the gold dust and sometimes licking paintbrushes that they were applying it with. And big, big no-nos there for sure. Very, very sad actually um, that that occurred. Um, talking about some of the various pieces, which has always just amazed me for something with such a short production. Um, the cake plates, the cake salvers. I actually think this came in two. This is probably the smaller of the ones that still got my little auction <laughs> stickers on there. I left that on there for fun. Um, and this is a different mold than the bowl here. It's not just a flattened out bowl. So it's, it's amazing to me how many different molds they made for this pattern that supposedly only ran for three years. Because making molds at the time was a horribly expensive process. Um, and this, this piece right here, this um, footed comport, probably has the best gold I've ever seen in my life on it. Um, I, I have no idea how this survived like this, but I was thrilled to pick up that piece at some point. Um, this is a celery vase. You can see that in the different colors. I brought that along to just kind of, so you could see everybody. Uh, this was another common thing at the time. You'd have your stalks of celery sticking out of there so you could pick them out and eat them. Um, couple of sizes of puff boxes, small and large. You could also use these for trinket dishes or whatever, and I suspect they did get a lot of different uses out of those. Um, the ladies' cologne. 
Um, an example of, of how they would use the same mold for different things, right? You've got your syrup over here and your little handy dandy finger lamp over there. Um, and then also all the crimpings that they might do to the same molded piece here. Uh, just various things that they could do and then mark it for different purposes. I, I actually think this might have been for some kind of business cards or something along those lines. Oh, I was gonna say soap dish. Soap dish, could be a soap dish too. Yep, absolutely. Um, the vases, um, I, I don't know how they marketed those and I'm not sure they did. Uh, because there's such a variation of those and they're so odd and uh, I, I, I'm not sure if they were just sold out of the factory or they're just made for fun by the workers like I said I, I never purchased one of those except right around where the factory was um, we have the straight up salt and pepper shakers these are the more common ones these bulbous ones are another pair that were never there's never been any catalog um, reproductions or anything seen or any anything about them. It's like they never made them, but here they are. Um, they made custard or punch cups, but no punch bowl. Uh, go figure. Go figure. Mm. That's really delicate looking. The handle, is it as, as delicate as it is? No, it's, it's, it's pressed here. <laughs> it's pressed on and it's pretty well solid. Yeah, interesting. From a distance it looks. Yeah, it looks really kind of kind of delicate for for what it is uh, I don't think they did um, probably if I were to guess on that I would guess that they sold the bottoms and had some other company make the metal lids and market them probably through that company that that's a guess on my part um, different styles of pitchers they did the tankard and the jug that you would sell and you would probably get once again with six tumblers got a tumbler example next to each one of those um, odd pieces like square relish dishes um, this set right here this was actually a marketed set um, it was a men's smoking set with the tray the tobacco jar match holder cigarette and cigar holder it also came with what they called an ashtray, which also was marketed as a woman's pin tray. So they used that multiple. And the odd thing about this, calling this an ashtray, is there's no indentations for anything on this. So I, I think they just kind of were like, well, we're, we're on a mold, so let's just use that for whatever. Yeah, the, um, the cigarette, cigar, and tobacco, and show us, beautiful. So when I bought this set, what did I pay for it? Now this was, now prices have changed a lot as oh, everyone yeah. in here knows. And particularly early stuff, the earlier, the more hard hit the prices have been. Mm. So I remember when I first started collecting Wayne Scroll in the 90s, if you wanted to get a table set, or a berry set, it was probably gonna cost you 250 to $350 yeah. for a nice set. Present day. Present day, mm. I don't think you can give them away, sadly. Um, it, it, I would say if I had a set, uh, let's say a table set, I would try to get 75, 80 bucks for it, maybe. And maybe feel lucky if I got 50. I mean, it's just it's just the nature of collecting today. But even with the gold on there. Yes. Yeah. The now, the tobacco set, the smoking set, is different than that. I want to say when I bought that in the late 90s, I probably I paid a lot for it. I probably paid $1,200 for it. Oh, so wow. A lot. A lot. Um, I would still expect that this set would be about half that today. Yep. It's a rare, still a rare item. Smoking items are still collectible. Oh, yeah, um, very much so. so I would say that. But, but the more common pieces, as we all know, in just about everything uh, from the Depression back have, have just died in price. It is what it is. Um, 
let's see. So, it, and they made all sorts of different trays um, in some fascinating shapes. Um, I just love these sort of blobby, amorphous, and they, they made them in, this was made in at least three sizes, including the large one that's sitting down here. Um, and it's kind of unusual for that time. And they tended to view more straightforward shapes, squares, or or maybe, you know, for a condiment set, something like this. Um, so that was kind of neat. Um, even at the time, when something is popular, there are lookalikes. So Jefferson Glass had an extremely similar pattern to this. Um, the, the Heise one has three dots running right across here. The Jefferson pattern has a sort of a crescent shape that goes across here. But it, if, you're not, if you're not familiar with it, it it's a fooler for sure. And theirs was a much smaller set. They didn't have the wide variety. And you can see these sort of trinket boxes that are extremely similar to Heise's, almost an exact match. Um, quality is not as nice. And you can see them in black, and you can see them in an odd clam broth that's not as nice as the Heise opal. Um, and they even have the three little dots across there, but they were not produced by Heise. They were produced by someone else who probably took the Heise trinket box and just copied it uh, straightforward. Um, you know, at the time, the, the, the patents weren't, they, they, and they just didn't bother with it. Um, it's rare with the ruby staining in gold and this was not done at the Heise factory. This would have been purchased by another company and done elsewhere and then remarketed by that company. Now the bottom was clear. Yes, because oh. this ruby is applied. Okay, I got it. So they would apply this and then, I, whether it, I think it's staining, I forget which one it is, but one of them where it's refired and one of them where it's not, and it's probably not refired. So it wear off. So it would, it, it, it will come I mean, off. And you know, and if you take this piece and you hold it up to the light, you can see yeah. parts coming through it there. But that would have done been done by someone else, much like applying a metal lid or something like that where it would be resold. A um, Couple of other things to note. This custard stopper is probably not original. This was probably stuck in here by someone along the way when they broke the crystal one. To my knowledge, on at least on the wing scroll, Heise never did colored stoppers, and that they were all crystal stoppers on their stuff. And this one, which is very nicely cut, is probably not original either. Somebody probably broke the stopper along the way, found one that happens to fit, and stuck it in there. Uh, this is an original stopper. Uh, it is actually pressed and not cut. Most likely on these items at this time, they would not have cut the stoppers. Why? Too much time. Too time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Are you saying that the, the top has been cut, or are you talking about the, the bottom where it's been broken off? No, the, the, the facets of the stopper okay. itself. Thank, that's a great question. Thank you. No, that's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, just so we're clear. Um, this is actually came out of a mold pressed. They would have to break off the bottom and they did uh, this one. Because I know the green tongue glass didn't cut the bottoms of their stoppers. They were just kind of rough and crummy. Yeah. And like Fenton would cut the bottoms of their stoppers. So, so this one, mm -hmm. it's just, I think it's just broken off. Yeah. Um, which doesn't surprise me at all. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, I wasn't sure which part you were cutting. Right, right. So yeah, the facets. Okay, thank you. Um, you can find some Heise items with cut faceted stoppers, but that generally came a little bit later when they started doing more cutting. They opened a cuttings department and started doing a little more cutting a little bit later. Um, questions? There, yes, Eddie. Um, is there a way that they ID their stuff, like uh, markings, labels, anything like that? Great question. Uh, at this time, between when the factory opened in 1896 and 1901, when production was stopped on this, there were no markings. 
and you just have to know the patterns. Now in 1901, one of A.H. Heise's sons created the Diamond H logo, which he actually derived from some kind of a fraternity symbol where he went to school. Um, and then they started marking the glass uh, with the Diamond H in the bottoms, and it's actually in the mold, so it, 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 it's, it's in the mold itself. Um, so anything that has that Diamond H would be from 1901 or later. But up till now, you just have to know your patterns. And you just gotta know uh, what it is. I, personally, aside from some of these littler items, you know, when, when you find a big tankard like this, if you're familiar with this wing, scrolly thing on there, you're gonna know what it is. Uh, it's just a matter of, of and uh, handed out some little flyers there, which has a nice little smattering of the, of the items itself, the catalog reproduction there. So I say anybody who's interested, take that home. It won't take long for you to ingrain that in your memory and, and be good to go. Um, Jeff, were all the colors for the entire run of it? I have no idea. Okay. It's a great question. Don't have a clue on that. I think based on the scarcity, we can assume that either some of these were uh, more expensive or less popular or produced for a shorter time. And that's really all the hypothesis. Um, I, or less marketed even, could very well be. Or less popular. Or less popular, right, absolutely. I mean, the crystal, generally you see a lot of crystal in these patterns, but there's not a lot of the wing scroll out there. So clearly they were really pushing the custard and then the emerald for sure. In those patterns when they were selling it. In fact, if you look at the little re, uh, the little catalog reprint, it even says Iverina Verde right on it. What's your favorite piece on the table? <laughs> it's got to be this one. It's got to be this one. I didn't even guess that. Yep. Um, I, I've been fascinated by the, the swung bases and the variety of shapes and sizes that you can see. And these are all, almost all of them, it's not the same piece they're doing it from. They're all different size bases and stuff, so they're just, it strikes me that they're just messing around with it. And I, when I, I still can't believe I actually have five of them because they're very unusual to see those. I am fascinated by that. And then I, I love the gold on this one, so it's become one of my favorite pieces as well. Um, and I'm always, the smoking sets, I've never smoked in my life, but they fascinate me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have store sold at? That's another really good question. I'm gonna guess the nicer department stores, but even in smaller towns, uh, jewelry stores, absolutely. Yeah, just depending on where you work. If you're in Milwaukee, you're probably gonna to go to a nice department store to get this stuff. But if you're in a small town, jewelry stores. Yeah, I know that. I know that um, my my grandma bought her Heise Orchid in the 40s from a jewelry store. And um, the large, the larger case that the design underneath, um, to me that appears to have uh, an edge that curls up. Have you ever seen that? Um, that mold shape? No, the larger one. Oh, this one. To your left. Yes. Have you ever seen that where it was where it was um, brought up more to be like a footed bowl? Yeah, I I think I think I, I yes, definitely. In fact, I've so seen. To me that looks like it wants to also be a bowl. I have one at home, I didn't bring it because it's too similar, but I've got one like this where it literally cups up and flares out a little oh, bit. Pretty. Okay. Yeah. It didn't have the gold on it, so okay. I brought this one instead. I thought that was kind of overkill to bring two of them. But yeah, absolutely, they, they definitely did that in different, uh, and I, I've never seen, I've never seen the cake salver or this <coughs> bowl, I don't think, in catalog reprints either. Um, I'm sure they were available in some kind of lists or something at the time. They didn't actually have pictures of them. Um, but like, like special orders or something on their order, maybe? I, yeah, I, I mean, I have no idea. It was so long ago, I mean, think about it, it was 120 plus years ago. And the, the documentation was sparse at the time. And who saved it? I'll get tossed out um, along the way. <coughs> Other questions? Yeah. Well, we said we don't have any patterns that are I know all I, from you I bought that lovely fan, the fan base with all the heavy etching on it, and it had a, a uranium foot. So it seems like they, they did a lot of <coughs> clear glass, right? 
Heisey? Heisey, yes. So they, they made a large amount of these Yeechee, Beechee patterns. Um, and I, I just brought in another one example, but they did, they did dozens of these types of patterns, many of them with more of the cut glass look. Or, and then later, as the cut glass look kind of went out, a lot of the colonial stuff came in and more in the, in the teens. Uh, right before we got into the color depression era stuff, uh, and even 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 tens and teens, but yeah, they did they did tons and tons of patterns. Um, I I would suggest probably going over there and checking out those books <laughs> uh, to see how many there actually are because there are tons of those. Uh, other questions? Yes. So a lot of these, because molds were very expensive, a lot of them, when the pattern ended, were repurposed, retooled in something else. So a lot of the early molds like this are gone. Um, and a lot of them were scrapped for the war effort as well. Um, the ones that still exist were passed <coughs> at some points a few uh, went to Cambridge, and a few went to some other companies, and Imperial actually acquired the majority of the existing molds. And Heise Collectors of America, when Imperial went out of business, actually purchased those molds, so they still exist today. So HCA, every year, puts out a number of items and for uh, you know souvenir items for the convention, or just items to generate money for the, for the uh, for HCA themselves, and, and you will see the various patterns, much later ones, usually uh, 30s, 40s patterns in those in, in various colors, and marked by the manufacturer. A lot, I think a lot of Moser is doing a lot of the ones now. Um, and so Heise closed at the end of 1956. Um, A.H. Heise's sons uh, were not quite as savvy as he was um, when it came to running businesses. And um, what happened at the end was very kind of sad. They traditionally, um, at Christmas time, everybody would go home for two weeks and they sent him home at the end of 56 and just never opened again, with no warning. Yeah, very sad. But they were in business for almost 60 years. Heise Collectors of America have what's left. Yep. Uh, any other questions? All right, so we're going to turn off the lights. I brought a, a big uh, black light here. We'll turn off the lights. And Is this one just a... Yeah, just one right there. Oh, there they are. All right. Well, let's see what we can do here. <laughs> so, count, your, count your pieces. <laughs> count your pieces. <laughs> so it does glow, just not quite as much. It's unfortunate that that white um, tablecloth there really hides the glow from the from the emerald. Um, and even the green, or even the clear, glows quite nicely when you get a, a black light over here by it. Uh, let's see the milk. Not really, no. no. But as you can see, the even the crystal has a considerable amount of the uranium salts in it as well. Hold up your favorite piece of that glow light. The front one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Audience, please. Oh, there you go. Heavy duty. Yeah. yeah, the Vaseline, of course, should should actually yeah. blow the most. Yeah, but how do you know that they didn't put magnesium in there? Magnesium. Ann brought up the question for, I think it was Holly, that we were talking about that jar that they said, was it uranium? Yes. Or magnesium. 
Manganese. Oh. Manganese. I assumed, but I'm not familiar with what manganese does to it. I thought that that made it a slightly different color, but. But I'll, I'll uh, and if you think that was manganese in there, I will bow to your expertise. Crystal glass. The old crystal glass, you put manganese in it to help it be more crystal clear. So do you think that's what's yep. blowing here and not uranium? And not uranium. Okay. That's why I brought it up. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I did not know that. That's why the glow is more faint. And the manganese is what causes old crystal glass. Right, right. right. Thank you. I, I, I did not know that. I appreciate that. That's great. Great information. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, guys.